The third way I think he expressed his passion was precisely this athleticism. President Ford was depicted on Saturday Night Live as the guy who's going to trip and fall. He was the best athlete, bar none, in the White House. 50 push-ups every day in the White House. He rode his, his bicycle in the Oval Office 20 miles a day, his uh, stationary bike. So this was a guy who took his physical fitness really seriously. That's really, you know, I've been mentioning the classics a lot, that harkens back to the Greek ideal. Greeks in ancient Athens and ancient Sparta said, you have a duty as a citizen to be in good shape. If you're not in good shape, your health is going to go down. You cannot be the citizen you should be. Um, you have some of Plato's dialogues where Socrates actually makes fun of people who become overweight. They can't fight in the military and defend because remember those, those ancient democracies and republics had citizen armies. They did not have professional standing armies. So it's the citizen's duty to go to the gymnasium, stay in shape. That was truly, a, that was a serious civic duty. It's not like going over here to uh, the Y. I mean, it was truly very different. It was a social event to go to the gymnasium, keep yourself in good shape, and not let yourself get heavy or a little flabby. Um, and we have abundant evidence of this from the literature of ancient Greece. In a sense, President Ford really took that classical ideal seriously. Now, he was not a real tall man. He was six feet, six one, something like that. I mean, when he and I stood, I mean, I think he had, of course, lost a little bit of his stature just through age, but he's in his 90s for Pete's sake. Uh, but I still had to look up to him, which was appropriate. Uh, but he still carried himself very well into his 90s. And it was quite impressive to see and to be with him. What he had, he had presence. And he knew how to use that presence. It's part of a little bit of stagecraft. He knew how to walk into a room erect with a military bearing and to have a, a commanding sense of presence to other people in the same way that George Washington used his sense of presence, the way that Abraham Lincoln used his height and even magnified it with the stovepipe hat. Presidents know what they're doing. They advance. Tall men do have an advantage over guys my height. No, no question about it. The research shows the taller you are, the more likely it is that you're going to be selected as a leader and then get your way as a leader. There are obviously famous examples of uh, exceptions like Napoleon, but Ford had a sense of presence. Yes? It seems to me there's a little bit of a parallel between um, uh, Harry... Um, Harry Truman? Harry Truman. Uh-huh. Yes, because he had so many hard breaks. I mean, it was a character building, just like Ford. Yes. About heartbreaks, character building. And yes. And he certainly, you heard about uh, Truman doing, going these on these sprints. The newspaper, the paper, the newsman couldn't keep up with him. I didn't hear about Ford and his doing all this exercise. I mean, maybe of the maybe that was knowledge, common knowledge, but I didn't know that. So those. A little bit the same. I was just thinking about the characteristics of those two. I think that's a very astute observation. And it's true that Harry Truman, because of his vision being so bad, always felt that he had to compensate for that a little bit. My, my grandfather, in fact, fought alongside Harry Truman in France. And he wasn't Irish. Excuse me? I'm sorry. We just heard another lecture. Oh, OK. On, on uh, Truman <laughs> and there was the Irish troops who were these big bullies. Oh, was okay. A little guy who was a lieutenant, he was supposed to tell him what to do. <laughs> but he sort of put him right in the place. Yes, so. yes. And they, and they respected him. Right. No, my, my grandfather had the utmost respect. My family's from Independence, Missouri, and had the utmost, my, the Whitney family farm was right next door to the Truman family farm, and um, my family had the utmost respect for President yeah. Truman. Absolutely. Uh, so there are some, some interesting parallels there. Let me move on. I, I, I don't want to talk at you too long, especially since this is such an informal setting. I don't want to test your patience. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate these remarks considerably. But the third quality that the classical period put on statesmen uh, is, is character. What is the character of a leader? Now, this expressed itself in several ways uh, in President Ford. Um, it expressed itself in his sense of service. If you think of all of the things he did, he served our country and the public in the Navy, 
then as a 13-term congressman, then as the first unelected vice president, and then the first unelected president. And then somebody in retirement. He never really retired. He continued to serve assiduously all kinds of causes. For example, the Boy Scouts, which were near and dear to his heart in his retirement. So here's a man who always felt, even though he came from a very humble background, uh, you know his background, he was born technically in Omaha, Nebraska to a horrible man named Leslie Lynch King, and his mother had been, was abused when, when Leslie Jr. was a very young lad, um, we're talking just months old, she decides to move back to her parents in Grand Rapids and literally save, that she thought she was saving her life and her son's life. So he starts out in terrible circumstances and then of course meets Gerald Ford Sr. She does. And uh, his mother and Ford get married and, and uh, Sr. adopts Gerald Ford Jr. So it's very touching. It's not a, it's not a storybook home life. Uh, we tend to think that, that people who are very successful must have some, some special what, what's special is that they're able to overcome being the walking wounded that we all are. They overcome it in special ways because their character has been tested by terrible trials in, in childhood and young adulthood when they're in formation and they come through glowing. So um, his, his character was forged in these difficult circumstances. In fact, he never remembered meeting his, he didn't remember his father and all of a sudden he He's waiting table one day, and he's about 16 years old, 16 or 17, and his biological father comes in, President Ford says, may I help you? And, and Leslie Lynch King says, I'm your father. Ford was stunned, absolutely stunned. And Leslie Lynch King said, well, I know I haven't done anything to help you growing up. So he takes out his wallet, and he pulls out a $20 bill, gives it to him, says, here, kid. Ford went home that night, and my understanding is he wept. He was in a rage. I mean, how could his father have abandoned him and then dared to come back under those circumstances, giving him a 20 as though that would be the blood guilt money, that all, all that would be needed for the life that Leslie Litch King had been spending. And Ford was deeply hurt by that. So this is a man who knew pain as a child and became stronger as a result of it. No storybook start to life. And he goes on to serve. He had tremendous courage. Uh, on the football field you could see it. In the Navy you could see it. He served with distinction. And then came when he was President of the United States for one month. And he'd gone to press conference after press conference in which Reporters had asked the question, what are you going to do about Nixon? Is Nixon guilty? Is there going to be a deal? And Ford said, later he said, you know, I was devoting 25% of the presidency to the question of Richard Nixon. We had so many issues that we were facing as a country with inflation and economy that was starting to struggle, trying to get out of Vietnam honorably. You know, energy problems. I could not have Richard Nixon always be on the front burner. And so he consulted several of the clergy, and he asked them, what is to teach me the difference between justice and mercy? And what do I need to do? What is the right thing to do here? And he decided to make a decision. He went to church on that Sunday morning, a month later, in September of 74, and after church and after time alone, he called a press conference and he said, I'm going to pardon Richard Nixon. The most controversial decision of his career, of his presidency, many people later said that cost him the presidency. His approval ratings plummeted. But he said, I did the right thing. I'm going to get Nixon behind me.